In the plant world, just like our own, not everyone can be beautiful or sweet. But even a lowly weed can get us to work for it, and quite slavishly at that, if it's clever enough to cash in on a skill that every plant is born with, its ability to make chemicals. The genius of plants is really the arts of biochemistry. Creating these really interesting, complicated, original molecules. Some are designed to produce flavors. Others are designed to produce great beauty. And then you've got this class of plants that is producing these molecules that incredibly have the power to alter what goes on in the human mind. This plant, by making just such a molecule, has gotten us to spread it all over the world. Scientists call it cannabis. It is better known as marijuana. Cannabis recognized, metaphorically speaking, that this was its path to world domination. Produce more of this molecule, and there will be more marijuana plants given more habitat by this creature who likes what this molecule seems to do. And by trying to figure out just how that molecule works, scientists stumbled on an amazing discovery about the workings of our brains. This plant has opened up this very fruitful path of inquiry into understanding how memory works, how consciousness works, how emotion works. We have unlocked this whole mechanism, which we didn't know existed, and we would not know existed if not for this plant. Human beings are born with an innate drive to experience other states of consciousness periodically. I think you can see this in young kids who begin spinning at early ages. <laughs> Amusement park rides serve the same purpose. There's an endless stream of activities that, that can shift consciousness, everything from singing, dancing, having sex, jumping out of airplanes, uh, and, and drugs are clearly one way of getting these experiences. People like to have that altered consciousness. I'm not saying that's good, but it's uh, individuals seek it out. Marijuana seems to have made an evolutionary decision long ago that it was going to throw its lot in with human beings. From the plant's point of view, the psychoactivity is an attractive characteristic which has brought the plant great success. There's a lot more marijuana being grown today, and the reason is that humans like it. They like it because it gets them high. But cannabis can also get them locked up. There are about 750,000 arrests a year for cannabis possession, which makes it about third among all crimes. And so you've got 25 or 30,000 people behind bars at any one time for cannabis offenses. But marijuana still entices nearly 15 million Americans to smoke it every month. And nearly 100 million have tried it. To keep up with that demand, cannabis growers cater to the plant's every whim. Yeah, we're going to lose that cap, aren't we? Yeah? Roots, yes. yeah, look at that, though. Pampering it. That's like a problem. spoiled child. Nice and healthy. We do anything it tells us to. If the plant says it wants something, we listen and we give it to it. And that's the whole thing. Listening carefully, and we're listening all the time, and observing all the time. We work for them. This man and woman live in a state where growing marijuana for medical use is legal. We agreed to conceal their identities because they still risk prosecution under federal law. Yeah, that's a beauty. But whatever the legal risks, the horticultural challenges they face would be familiar to any farmer or gardener. It's a daily effort, and there are things like, oh, did we over-nutriate the water? Did we under-nutriate the water? Everything has really tight parameters, and we try to keep as tight as control as possible, but it's, it's a battle. My associate is really the green thumb in this enterprise. And I've noticed that when she's not around for a couple of days, the plants know it. I mean, I'm not making that up. They literally know it. I mean, I, I almost hear them whispering, where is she? 
They don't do as well, you know, they don't seem as happy. Strange as it may seem, these cannabis growers are part of a very long tradition. In every culture and in every age of history, an enormous amount of human energy has gone into the production, distribution, and consumption of psychoactive plants. The only society that we know of for whom there is no native intoxicant are the Inuits. And that's simply because nothing grows up there that they could use. In almost every society, one or two or a small number of intoxicants are accepted. And not only accepted, but their use is actively promoted. And the rest are condemned. But there's no agreement from culture to culture as to which are the good ones and which are the bad ones. So you have alcohol, which is an everyday drug used in our society, that has a taboo on it in Islamic society. And though cannabis is illegal in most places today, many cultures throughout history have tolerated it. From the time the plant was first discovered in India and China thousands of years ago, people have seen it as more than just an intoxicant. Long before the discovery of aspirin, cannabis was used as a medical treatment for relieving pain. Dealing with pain, you know, that's a, a tremendous part of human life. And it was a bigger part before modern times. We all did physical labor. We didn't have many painkillers. We didn't have antibiotics. And a lot of intoxicants, even if they don't diminish pain the way opium does, they take your mind off. And that's very, very important. In 19th century America, cannabis was a popular treatment for conditions such as labor pains, asthma, and rheumatism. You could walk into any drugstore in America and buy tinctures of cannabis. Cannabis was included in all sorts of medical preparations, and it was legal. But everything would change in the 20th century when the plant got its new name, marijuana. The name came from Mexico, where cannabis was a popular intoxicant. In fact, Pancho Villa's rebel army sang a marching song about a cockroach who fueled himself with marijuana. During the 1920s, many Mexicans immigrated to the United States, and some brought the custom of marijuana smoking with them. Cannabis was certainly more common among Mexican Americans and to some extent among African-Americans uh, in the 20s and 30s than it was among whites. I mean, you find it you know, very popular in the music scene in New Orleans, very popular among African-American musicians. The jazz world was really soaked in cannabis. The great Louis Armstrong felt marijuana enhanced his ability to improvise. Cannabis proposes this idea of time stopping, of being able to explore the present moment. Forget the past, forget the future, just be there and see what you can come up with. Even if it's a song you've played a million times before, it becomes new, strange, wonderful. You see new possibilities in it that weren't there before. In the 1960s, use of marijuana soared. The drug had been illegal for more than 20 years, but that didn't stop an entire generation from embracing it. It was well suited to the spirit of that time. You know, every drug has its character, and cannabis's character is not about being hyper and working really hard. It is a drug that makes you not want to strive. It's about kicking back, listening to music. So it just kind of fit the spirit of the 60s. Marijuana seems to second the motion, no matter what the motion is. To many Americans, the fact that millions of young people were smoking marijuana threatened the very fabric of society. Those fears prompted the government to take action. Operation Intercept is designed to make it more difficult to bring marijuana into the country. 
Most of the marijuana was coming in from Mexico, and the plant soon found itself under attack. The weapon, a toxic chemical called Paraquat. We have to remember that in the evolution of a species, everything counts as a factor of natural selection, including things like, oh, the decision by the United St States government in the 70s to pressure Mexico to spray herbicide on their pot fields. From 1975 to 1983, Mexican pilots doused the country's cannabis fields with the poison. There was some concern that it would get into the product coming north if it was cut right after it was sprayed, and that as people inhaled this, it probably wasn't very good for you. This is a drug testing lab in Palo Alto, California. The people here are receiving 300 samples of marijuana a day from smokers who want to know if their pot is contaminated. People are extremely anxious about this problem, and frankly, I don't blame them. Mexican marijuana began to develop a very bad name. This had the unintended consequence of creating a domestic marijuana industry that hadn't really existed before. It was concentrated in California, Hawaii, and other states whose climate was favorable for the tropical plant. Once this American marijuana agriculture got started, it was very, very successful, and the government was kind of shocked to find one year that the total amount seized exceeded their estimate of the total size of the crop. And they realized, oh, I think we're missing something. There must be a lot more marijuana out there. And indeed there was, all over the West Coast. The government dispatched helicopters to find the fields and forced the growers out of business. When local and federal agents raided this marijuana field in Northern California today, they found more than $50,000 worth of marijuana ready to be harvested. A task force is waging an all-out war against pot. So with the rise of the drug war, in a way, you've got a threat to this plant. And it's very interesting to see how the plant coped. Cannabis, as plants so often do, found a way not only to survive the threat, but to come out ahead. And what happened? Well, the growers and the plant adapted. They moved indoors. The problem with moving indoors is this is a 12-foot tall plant. So what they needed were the genes of a shorter cannabis plant to breed with their tall plant. So the pioneers of indoor growing crossbred the tall, warm weather species, cannabis sativa, with a low growing mountain species found mostly in Asia, cannabis indica. They brought together these two great strains in the marijuana family and created a plant that was short, fast and strong. The plant, which had once been a skinny little piece of ditch weed, is now a pampered, spectacularly good-looking, multicolored, rich, resinous being. Hardly the species it was before at all. It's turned completely into something else. Nurtured by creative indoor gardeners, cannabis is now a far more potent plant than it was a generation ago. The key to that transformation was stripping away the rule of nature and replacing it with our own. It's an artificial environment, completely artificial. Everything about our natural world is unnatural. Everything. It's really like a super plant. In the natural world, the plants here would be six to nine months from seed to harvest. That's just simply inefficient. You couldn't justify an operation with such a slow turnaround. So instead of six to nine months in my world, these plants uh, live their entire life cycle in 90 days. To get them to do that, the plants are subjected to precisely controlled amounts of nutrients, water, and light. They are under lights that are blindingly bright, thousands of watts, 24 hours a day. And these plants are just like soaking up this light. They love it. I mean, they're just bathing in light and growing so fast, you can almost hear the creak of their cells as they stretch and divide. All that light generates a tremendous amount of heat. If I didn't have air conditioning and air circulation and ventilation fans moving the heat out of that room, these plants would cook in a matter of hours. It's so complicated.